You know, I've had several people contact me. They've been very, very concerned about uh, operating their freeze dryer in warmer temperatures, uh, temperatures that can uh, sometimes approach 85 and maybe even a little bit warmer. Um, the rule of thumb is once you get to 90 degrees, there's nothing you can do. But I have some tips and tricks and things you can do to make it so that your freeze dryer will operate very effectively at temperatures um, above 80 and um, a maximum, I would say, of 85 degrees. There are some things you can do, and I'm going to explain that here in a little bit. Now, I apologize for the setup. I just got home from work, and I went and I purchased some food that I could put into my freeze dryer, but I remembered I wanted to use this as an intro to a meeting, okay? So um, we're gonna, I'm going to tell you what I got here. I'm going to tell you why this much food is okay. And then after this, when this comes out of the freeze dryer, I'll finish up this video and we'll discuss how it is that you can overcome some of the obstacles that are presented by temperatures. Uh, perhaps you have your freeze dryer in a garage or something. So with that, I'm Evan Rowell and this is Critical Thinking. Okay, we're back, and these four trays that you saw that had the, uh, the garlic chicken, as a matter of fact, I'll show you the package that they came out of. I really like these. This is the, uh, the bird's eye, the skillet dinners. You know, you just put this in a pan, add a little water, and cook it in viola. You've got, uh, you've got something to eat. But I like these because they come pre-frozen. All I have to do is throw them in the pan, put them in the freeze dryer, and I also find that one of these 42 ounce bags will fit in one pan really well. It'll stack up a little bit higher than the three quarters of an inch minimum, but that's because um, there's air, it's not solid. And that is the caveat to the three quarter inch rule is if what you're putting in the pan has a lot of air mixed in with it, there's a lot of little pieces and stuff like that, you can actually load the pan up pretty good. And what I do is I'll take the bag and I cut the label out of the bag and then I taped the label right here and I also write up here what it is in case that label comes off but that that helps me keep track of exactly you know what I'm doing what I'm storing things and what I have in the bag now there's nothing particularly interesting about freeze drying uh, what I have here you put it in the pan you put it in the freeze dryer and you let the freeze dryer complete its cycle and you take it out and you package it and, and you're good to go. But I did something a little bit differently and if you have been following me to any degree you know that I am all about saving time and saving energy and saving effort when it comes to freeze drying and you can do that. Because the bottom line is the people at Harvest Right when they manufactured and designed their freeze dryer they designed it to do a, probably 125 to 130 percent of what is necessary to freeze dry food. Okay, and that is to make sure that no matter what you put in there, uh, it's going to be in there long enough to where there's no water, there's no moisture, there's no nothing, and it'll come out looking just exactly the way this is. But the problem that I have with that is 25 percent runtime on your freeze dryer, that's a lot of runtime. That can be anywhere from 10 to 12 or more hours depending upon what your extra dry time is set at. And so for me, I watch the, uh, the temperatures inside the freeze dryer and once that temperature gets up to 125 degrees and it stays there for two or three hours, I know that the sublimation process inside the freeze dryer has stopped and the freeze dryer has turned into a big expensive um, dehydrator in a vacuum okay because your vacuum pump is still running and your refrigeration uh, unit is still running and it's still consuming energy and it's still consuming wear and tear on your machine and uh, it's not necessary all right so um, what I did here is I demonstrated that here when I took these out the machine hadn't even gone into final or um, extra dry time okay that orange bar which you can see here was all the way across and the temperature was over 100 degrees and it had been that way for several hours and I wasn't going to wait um, for the freeze dryer to finish it. Now you can 
There is absolutely nothing wrong. If you get a freeze dryer and you don't have a dehydrator and you don't want to mess with it and you want to make sure that you do everything correctly and you don't have to worry about things like that, just let the freeze dryer do its thing all the way to the end. Um, you'll be, you know, energy wise and, and use wise and everything, it'll be fine as long as you're satisfied with that. But me, I'm, I'm not satisfied with that. I'm, I'm going to cut anywhere from 10 to 15 hours off of my freeze dryer time by incorporating my dehydrator. And that's exactly what I did with these. Um, what had happened is these were in for 33 hours and it hadn't even gone into final dry yet, or uh, um, extra dry yet. But the bar, that orange bar was all the way across the front and it had been in, um, the trays had been over 100 and I think it was 124 degrees for well over three hours. And so I decided that it was time to take it out. And so when I took it out, sure enough, um, there was no more moisture. And, I'll, and a subsequent video, probably the next one, I'm gonna tell you what happens to the food if you go ahead and try to push the limits the way I do sometimes and put wet food into the dehydrator. Um, it, it's okay to do that, but it does have an effect on your food that, that it may be something that you don't want. But anyhow, I knew that this um, garlic chicken or um, garlic shrimp is what it is, that's what I got in here, shrimp, was ready to be put into the dehydrator because there was no moisture, at least no moisture that you could feel. The, there was the cool underneath. I knew that there was some water vapor in there, but I also knew that if I put it in the dehydrator, the water vapor would, um, would quickly dissipate. I'd be shaving 12 hours off the run time on my dehydrator and quite frankly it took less than an hour to completely dry this and I want to show you this. This was completely dry. Okay? This stuff is almost like cellophane or packing peanuts if you will. It is completely dry. You couldn't tell one bit if I had let this run that extra 10, 12 hours in my freeze dryer, or uh, you'd never know that I had taken it out and put it into a um, dehydrator. Now again, this takes experience, but it doesn't take a lot. You don't have to be into freeze drying for five or six years before you, you can tell what the food looks like when it is ready to be packed. And this was ready to be packed after 33 hours in the freeze dryer and about an hour in my dehydrator. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to put that in here. Now, I weighed this and it lost a lot of water. This lost four and a half cups of water, which means uh, four and a half cups is about 40 ounces of water. And this lost 40 ounces of water. So I put on here garlic shrimp in a sauce with pasta and vegetables, add four and a half cups of water, heat in skillet, stir often. Okay, and I've, uh, an another thing I do, this is something you might consider, is if you're going to use um, felt tip pens on these, which I do, I find that if I rub that enough, that will come off of there. So what I do is I'll take piece of tape and this is three inches wide and I will cover that label on top of there. Okay, it's the same tape I used to put this label on but I wanted to show you that I do this because it um, it makes it so that what you've written on here isn't going to rub off. Okay so with that let's go ahead and put a Let's get that out of there. Put a um, oxygen absorber in there. Seal it back up, and put the oxygen absorber in the bag. Okay. Now I keep as part of my huh, supplies down here. I will keep a spoon because I I do this quite often. Okay. And so I just sit here and I fill that bag up completely with what I have here. Now, you see I've already done this with the other three trays. 
These are already sealed, they're vacuum packed, and uh, they're ready to store. Okay, so that's in there, and I'm going to go ahead and seal this on the impulse sealer. And I always hold this down a little bit longer after the impulse sealer light goes off, because that allows it to cool, and it makes sure that the seal cools itself tight. And so when I pull this off, inspect that seal, that's a really good seal. Now, I shake it and I move it now to vacuum pack it. Again, I cut the corner off, leaving just this tiny little tiny hole that I can stick my needle into. So I'll cut right across my seal and the factory seal. And now I have a little tiny hole there. And I find that if I push the air out of it, it opens up that hole. Vacuum needle. Incidentally, um, very soon I'm going to make a video on how to build one of these um, vacuum needles. I'm going, to, I'm going to get everything fresh. I'm going to build one and uh, show you how to do it. So you turn that on. You see that thing pulling a vacuum out of there, and it works really well. Leave it in for about 15 seconds, and it'll, it'll vacuum down hard. After a while, you'll be able to listen to it. Because as it draws in more and more of a vacuum, you'll hear that little snap, crackle, and pop as that stuff compresses a little bit. And so I'll leave it in there until I'm not hearing that snap, crack, and pop anymore. And it's pretty much finished. You pull it out and hold it. Put it across your impulse sealer. And you have now sealed that bag. And that's ready for long-term storage. All right. So with that, I want, to, uh, I want to tell you about something else that I discovered not too long ago in one of my batches, is this right here. I was concerned, these are Bush's baked beans, and I found that I can put one and a half cans in the tray. I was concerned about the amount of sugar. There are Bush's baked beans has a lot of brown sugar, it has a lot of syrup, it has a lot of other stuff in it, and I was concerned that maybe it wouldn't freeze dry very well, but then I got to thinking about how I'm able to freeze dry sweetened condensed milk if I mix it with um, regular evaporated milk, and it does very, very well. And I thought, you know, the syrup and everything that is in these Bush's baked beans are mixed with a lot of bean solids and, and, and other stuff. And so, what the heck, I, I took two or three cans and I filled up two trays, of which this is just one, and I freeze dried it, and lo and behold, I was really, really surprised at how well it freeze dried. This is absolutely dry. I'm, uh, I'm not going to package it right now because um, I got other things I want to talk to you about. So with that, and let's talk about one of the concerns that a lot of people have when it comes to their freeze dryer, and I have received quite a few uh, inquiries about ambient room temperature. And so instead of going through, you know, dragging my camera around and showing me, showing you move all kinds of things around there, I'm going to do this with imagery, okay? And um, I have uh, taken quite a bit of effort to take the images I need to, to show you and discuss with you the things that you can do if you're concerned about the temperatures that your room has a tendency to get to. So with that, let's get started. Oh, and just a note, I was in the process of editing this video, and my wife was looking over my shoulder, and she goes, Evan, boy, your hands are dirty. I can clean your hands up a little bit better. Um, that frame right there I built in my garage 
uh, this morning, and I was in the process of staining it and getting it ready to bring down here. And so this stuff that you see in my hands right now is stain. I did try to get it off, but my wife insisted that I let you know why my hands were so dirty. She's kind of my manager that way. I love her. And so here I am. Dirty hands because of that frame. Okay, so the first thing you're going to see here is the size of the room that I keep my freeze dryer in. It's not really big. As a matter of fact, it's a, uh, a photographic dark room. There's probably only about 90 square feet on that floor. And the walls are all painted dark so that when I have to uh, darken things up, I don't have any light colored wall reflections. Okay, so if this was uh, not downstairs where temperatures are cooler in my basement, this could be a real concern. If this was, say, a room in a shed or a closet or something like that, there are some things that you need to pay attention to. All right, so the first thing that you need to pay attention to is the space between your walls and the sides of the freeze dryer. Um, conventional wisdom, and you'll hear a lot of people talk about this, uh, saying that you need to have at least four inches. Well, four inches for me is extraordinarily small. Uh, for me, you need to have at least eight inches, and, and that's eight inches of clear space. That doesn't mean that you can tuck your vacuum pump inside that eight inch space because that, uh, that vacuum pump creates heat and you have to have good circulation there. Now, I have 12 inches, but if you'll notice that shelf towards the top of my freeze dryer, um, that's a 12-inch shelf, and my freeze dryer won't go any closer to the wall, but that's perfectly good with me because that sets the distance. But make sure you have at least 8 inches, okay? And then, secondly, the top. Make sure that you don't have anything on the top of your freeze dryer because the whole the, your freeze dryer is all about dissipating heat and bringing the temperature of that barrel down to um, you know minus 50 degrees and or thereabouts and so everything that you do to stack stuff close to your freeze dryer walls be it walls or shelves or anything else that's going to hinder your freeze dryer's ability to work properly so you have to give your freeze dryer lots of space all right now one of the other things that I like to do is I like to put my vacuum uh, vacuum pump in front of the freeze dryer. I don't like to put it below it because the heat rises. Okay, and it, it, if, you, if it's underneath your vacuum pump or your freeze dryer, um, that heat is going to envelop your freeze dryer. And, and you know, that's what you're trying to avoid. I don't like putting it on top because then it becomes difficult to handle and to reach and to work with. Um, on, I, I don't put it on the sides because of that eight inch uh, rule that I have. So I put it in front. It doesn't have to be a long ways in front, but just as far as that vacuum hose will go. And uh, keep your vacuum pump in front. Okay, now that should be sufficient, really, if you are in an area where the ambient temperature maintains at 72 or below. You shouldn't need any more, uh, you shouldn't be concerned any more but if you're in an area where the temperature can start to creep up, the room is really small, and uh, if the room is really small like this, the uh, freeze dryer itself and the vacuum pump will create enough heat to rise the temperature inside the room. So you might have to put a big fan, a floor fan on it, and that floor fan is pointing directly at the freeze dryer so that it keeps that air circulating around the outside of the freeze dryer and keeps it from stagnating and becoming hot. Okay, now here is my turbo fan. This is, I do this on every um, batch. This is just routine for me. I don't use the big floor fan because like I say, I'm in a basement and heat isn't really a problem for me. But even though that's not a problem, I still use this turbo fan, okay? And here is the direction of air that is necessary for that air to flow. And this is important. You will find vent holes. Here you see the exhaust vent side. It's on the same side as your vacuum pump line. And then you have the intake vented side. And that is the side that your drain valve comes out of. Now, I'm not going to say for sure that some older units or different units or something's going to have this in reverse. I don't know. So what you need to do, and you need to make sure you do this, is to be certain in which direction that air inside of your freeze dryer is traveling. 
in mine, and I would assume that in most of the newer harvest right and even the older ones, the air is going to travel from left to right as you face the machine. Okay, but um, you need to make sure of that. So here's a close up of the intake side, and I've shown you this because behind that intake grid, you can see that condenser, and that condenser is the source of. 80 to 90 percent of the heat that your freeze dryer produces and so yeah and that's important when you consider where you want to put that big fan okay on the inset there you can see this is an actual picture of your refrigeration unit uh, that red arrow is pointing to the condenser and again that condenser produces most of the heat that is the real villain when it comes to heat and so that's what you need to pay attention to the green arrow is pointing to a fan you can't see it in this picture but there's a fan behind that condenser and the purple arrow is pointing to the compressor and it's the compressor that compresses that um, refrigeration fluid and makes it hot and then that hot refrigeration fluid is fed through the condenser and is cooled while it's under pressure so that when it goes to the cooling coils, um, when it decompresses, it will lose as much heat as it gained. And um, we'll, we can go into that a little bit you know, later about exactly how that works, okay? Now you see the blue arrows, that is the flow of air. And it is important that you not hinder that flow of air. That's why the space between your freeze dryer and the wall is so important, okay? Now, here's a picture of inside the freeze dryer. This is actually uh, a picture of the inside of my freeze dryer. And here you can see the condenser. And here you can see the fan. All right. And here you can see the direction of airflow from the fan. Here you can see the compressor. And uh, then this down here is my light that I used to light the whole thing up so you could see it. All right. So now you can see what is inside in that condenser is what we want to focus on. So now here's the fan that I have put on my freeze dryer. This is exactly how I put it on. This little turbo fan is put on the side of the freeze dryer that um, just on the other side of that grid is that condenser. This fan is aiding the airflow. It is working in concert with the fan on the inside to increase air pre or to increase airflow. If you were to put that fan on the other side of the freeze dryer, you would be fighting that internal fan and your freeze dryer would just, I don't know, I, I wouldn't want to try it, but um, it may not get to the temperatures it wants to get to at all because you, are, you would be fighting airflow. And so it's important that you know. So how do you tell which side is the intake and which side is the exhaust well like you saw before if you see uh, through the grid if you see that condenser coil it looks like the radiator in a car and it works pretty much the same way that's the side that you want to put the fan on okay on the other side if you put your hand next to the side of the freeze dryer like you see here you will feel warm air coming out all right, so now that way you can tell what direction the air is flowing through your machine. Okay, now if, if you're wondering if that fan makes a big difference, take a look at this picture. This picture is a piece of toilet paper that I taped to the side and left the fan off. Okay, so this is normal. This is normally what you're going to get. Now when I turn that fan on, look what happens to that toilet paper. It doubles that airflow. Okay, so having that doubled airflow is for me the most important thing and the most effective thing you can do. And in most cases, you don't need any of this other stuff that I'm going to show you here. But if you are in an area where temperature is really concerned, you can also do this. You can add a second vacuum hose and move your vacuum pump up to, you know, move it two hoses away from your freeze dryer and this will prevent the air from your vacuum pump the hot air that your vacuum pump produces from mixing up with uh, the air around your freeze dryer okay now i have two hoses here 
not that I need it, but I have that filter that I built, and I made a video on that previous on how to build that filter. And incidentally, that filter works wonderfully. I don't have to mess with it. I don't have to change that filter out. Um, as a matter of fact, I've looked inside of it one time since I put it on, and, there's, and I've had 15, 20 batches on it. And um, it does great as far as filtering out particulates and uh, controlling moisture and, and, and that type of stuff. But anyhow, uh, as you see here, you can couple two hoses together. You can, Harvest Right will provide these, the, the two silver ones, but they don't, they, they don't have the nipple. You will have to find that nipple yourself. But um, if you have just two hoses and you want to couple them together, that silver nipple up there, uh, it's a JIC nipple. And uh, you, can, you can buy those, uh, depending upon where you buy them. They can be pricey, though. I saw one the other day that was $72. But anyhow, put two hoses together and move that. As you can see here, that vacuum pump is over five feet away from the front of my freeze dryer. And incidentally, um, what you're looking at here, I'm using a very wide-angle lens, so distances look further than they really are. Uh, that's five feet and uh, incorporating two hoses, okay? And now, here's a warning. Uh, it's kind of a caveat. It's not necessarily a warning. I was talking with a, um, a Harvest Ride engineer the other day, and they indicated to me that the longer the hose, the vacuum hose is between your freeze dryer and your vacuum pump, the harder the vacuum pump has to work to maintain the vacuum. Now, I've never had a problem here. Okay, um, my vacuums will drop down to less than 300 millitors, um, and, and it'll do it just fine. I don't think that there's going to be a big problem, but just, just note that your pump is going to have to work a little bit harder if you have two hoses on there. So I don't recommend doing this unless you're really concerned about heat. So, and then the last thing, of course, is a, a yet a third fan. This fan right here I've got, I will point it at the vacuum pump, and the vacuum pump is sitting in front of the door, so the air that uh, this fan produces is blowing hot air from that vacuum pump right out the door. So these are all measures you can do. Um, there's, there's several of them there. The, like I say, the only one I use is putting that turbo fan on the side of the freeze dryer and blowing directly on that condensate. But uh, you can do all of these. You can put that floor fan. You can put the one turbo fan on there. You can move the, the freeze dryer or the uh, vacuum pump away from the freeze dryer with a double hose and then put a fan on the vacuum pump. There's a lot of different things you can do. As a matter of fact, if you want to talk about extreme cases, um, I've even, I even thought about putting that vacuum pump through the wall on the other side of the wall and just making a hole and running that hose through the wall to the vacuum pump in another room. You can do that. Uh, again, that's an extreme measure. And then if you, just, if you ha just have no other choice, your room is so small and you're out in the middle of the, the, the Australian outback bush where outside is 110 degrees all the time, you may have to put a room air conditioner in there. But that freeze dryer will not run in temperatures greater than 90 degrees. And you should have cooling if your temperature is over 80, but anywhere between 70 to 80 degrees, um, any one of these measures should work. And I would highly recommend putting that fan up against the side of your freeze dryer and kind of turbocharging the air that's going over that, condens that condenser. Because that condenser, that is where most of the heat from that freeze dryer comes from. Okay, so there you have it. How to deal with heat and again think about using a um, dehydration unit to cut a great deal of time off of your freeze dryer, um, wear, tear, energy use, and everything else. Um, as, you, as you work with it, as you figure out how to do it and, and what you can do and what you can't do, you'll become very comfortable with it and you'll save a lot of money okay, in energy. You'll save a lot of wear and tear on your machine uh, because effectively once that heater tray is been over 120 degrees for several hours, then what you have is a great big old dehydrator. Uh, sublimation has stopped 
and uh, or at least slow down to such a crawl that uh, it takes a long time because of the vacuum to turn that leftover moisture into vapor and have it condensate on the side of the barrel. So with that, I hope you'll like, I hope you'll subscribe. Again, um, I have uh, more videos in the works that will give you more information that you can use, more information that you can think about. Um, I, I try to avoid just sitting down and saying, well, let's freeze dry this, you take this, put it in the pan, freeze dry it, bring it out here, rehydrate it, knead it. No, everybody knows how to do that. You don't have to watch hundreds of videos to figure out how to do that. So with that, um, I'm Evan Rowell. I hope you'll like and subscribe. Oh, and visit my web or my uh, photographic website. There's the address. Leave a comment. Tell me what you think. Uh, it's kind of a thing with me. Uh, you don't have to, but uh, if you would, I'd appreciate it. It would help kind of make all of this worthwhile. So with that, I'm Evan Rowell, and this is Critical Thinking about Temperature.